Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining our webinar today on cyber insurance after a breach, how to prepare yourself and make sure that you're covered, uh, what happens when you do have a breach. And uh, we have uh, some terrific presenters today, Frank and uh, Tolga, both from ASMGI. And we're going to go over a, a number of aspects related to this. I would like to make mention that if you have a question during the webinar, please feel free to use the Q&A box on the lower right hand part of your screen. Uh, we'll get to the questions either real time or uh, towards the end of the webinar. Thanks again for joining us. And I'm, right now, I'd like to turn this over to Frank Yako from ASMGI. Take it away, Frank. Hey, thank you, Paul. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Uh, we definitely have a great topic, and uh, and hopefully we'll uh, we'll get some questions as we go through this. Um, definitely keep us honest as we're having our conversation today. And uh, let us know if you have any questions as we cover the, the various topics. So definitely appreciate everyone's time. I know uh, it's precious and uh, we'll we'll uh, try to keep uh, you on the edge of your seat as we go through things. So as Paul mentioned, uh, you know, we're gonna be talking about cyber insurance, but specifically getting into, you know, some of the requirements that uh, might exist for placing a claim or even uh, being eligible for a claim. And that's gonna, we'll talk about a number of different aspects of that as we go through the discussion today. So before we get into that, I'd like to introduce my uh, my co-presenter today, uh, Tolga Yanmaz. If you could uh, introduce yourself, Tolga. Thanks for uh, joining hey. me today. Thank you, Frank. Um, hi, my name is Tolga Yanmaz. I'm Director of Operations in ASMGI. I'm responsible for the teams that um, will uh, respond to managed services and cybersecurity incidents, uh, knock and sock incidents. And I'm really happy to be here today. Yep, thank you. And again, uh, Frank Yako, CIO and Director of Strategic Initiatives, work with many of our clients and uh, helping them hopefully avoid cyber incidents. But uh, then if something does happen, that's uh, where, where Tolga and his team uh, step in and, and do their magic. So again, uh, we'll, we'll jump right into it and uh, feel free as you, uh, as you know, um, if, uh, if you have any questions, just uh, please submit that in the uh, in the chat box and we'll uh, address those as uh, real time as we can. So from an agenda perspective, um, you know, again, we're going to talk about really um, defining what organizational risk is and, and, and just talking about what that means in today's world. Get into a little bit, uh, again, a refresher about uh, cyber insurance and then uh, talk about what we would define as risk management. And that's going to be, again, a combination of things that that we'll talk about, but again, tie that back to cyber insurance and and how the the two really uh, play together. And then uh, again, uh, you know, open for questions during the course of our conversation. Uh, but then also, uh, if you have any at the end or after we go through the conversation, we'll uh, field those as well. So, um, so you know, big question, you know, why are you attending today? And you know, again, um, you know, we we obviously uh, promoted this and uh, published it. The topic today, but really, you know, it's it's helpful to understand and uh, make sure that we're hitting all the different things that that you'd like to accomplish, but also at the same time, um, make sure that uh, you know we're we're addressing some of the things that uh, might have drawn you to the topic. So, you know, again, you know, maybe you're going through the process of uh, applying for cyber insurance and having some difficulties, or maybe you're even not insurable. That's uh, you know, that's again, we'll we'll explain why that's uh, relevant during the course of the discussion today. Also, uh, maybe you're dealing with some third party uh, risk management issues and that could be impacting um, your ability to be your risk profile as an organization. Um, or maybe you're working to understand you know, how to respond to assessments that uh, you might be receiving from your key clients or even um, insurance providers in order to address uh, you know, the risk profile of your organization. Um, or maybe you're under, trying to understand your risk profile as well. And that's something, again, that uh, is becoming more and more common. And we'll explain kind of how to go through that process. And then the last is to gain an understanding of um, your organization's uh, risk profile and uh, what that looks like from all the different aspects that are load, uh, itemized there, end user technology or applications and how those could impact you. Or maybe there's some other objective that you have. And again, um, that, uh, you know, we're, we're looking to, uh, you know, again, uh, that's where we want your feedback to see if there's other things that, that uh, you might have to, uh, to accomplish. 
So with that, um, you know, again, from an objectives and key takeaways, uh, provide an introduction or reintroduction to cyber insurance. Again, that's a, a pretty dynamic topic and there might be things that, uh, you know, if you haven't looked at your either policy or, or shop for those types of services uh, recently, uh, that might be able to, to go through and, uh, and, and uh, provide an overview of that. Um, also, we want to make sure that it's clear what the requirements are to acquire cyber insurance. Again, that's an ever-evolving um, component as well. And then, you know, we talked about the the risk management model uh, model and and how that ties back into cyber insurance as well. So, uh, from an organizational risk perspective, again, you know, this is uh, such a, a, a dynamic uh, component in the world we live in today, and it really breaks down into multiple multiple aspects. Uh, you know, one is from a business perspective, you know, very familiar with the different supply chain factors that are impacting organizations across the world today and how those, uh, you know, in, introduce risk to your ability to function as a business. Um, also, there's the potential for financial uh, loss, um, you know, based on, you know, the, the different threats and, uh, and the risks that exist today in, uh, in, in the world. And then also, you know, if there are any types of cyber incidents, uh, the potential for brand or reputational impact. And then also from a financial perspective, uh, you know, unfortunately, there's many organizations that experience some type of cyber incident and never recover from that. And that's, again, becoming more and more common, unfortunately. Uh, from a technology perspective, um, again, there's, uh, you know, the technology is uh, critical to every organization today, and, and we all rely on those. And those are really a combination of things that we support or use from an internal perspective, um, an external uh, service or, or you know, public provided services are becoming more and more integral to organizations, as well as all the integrations that exist between different service providers and technology providers as well. And then the last thing that's listed under technology is really service providers. And that again, ties back to the external services as well. Um, many of those are are uh, things that, you know, if we don't understand, you know, who we're relying on to do business, uh, then then that's an important part and, and poses a risk to organizations today. And then the last one from a threat perspective, there's both external and internal threats. And again, uh, you know, that's something that, you know, unfortunately, um, you know, there's uh, entities out there that will will bribe or go after internal, um, you know, even per, uh, employees to, to introduce, uh, you know, risks or even ransomware or other threats to the, an organization. That's something we have to deal with, unfortunately, today. From the standpoint of, um, you know, requirements for managing those, I, I'll turn it over to Toga maybe just to talk about, uh, you know, what those things are, uh, why, why we have to deal with those, uh, these risks today. Um, thank you. Uh, so, external, do you want me to talk external and internal? Yes, please. So, uh, obviously, external risks, um, any kind of uh, ICU that is going to, you know, either um, the highest um, uh, risk is somebody is getting credentials through uh, uh, a brute attack. Uh, Ransomware, you can name uh, several uh, different ones. And um, those, uh, uh, those threats um, is gonna affect uh, everything that is listed there, regulation, compliance, business commitment, contractual commitments, third party uh, is in there as well. From an internal perspective, um, you know, business vis uh, visibility, growth plans, new business plans, brand and reputation. Um, you know, we have a saying that, um, if your name is out there that you have been identified as someone um, is affected by a cybersecurity, um, you know, they throw a mod at you. And if it doesn't stick, it's going to leave a stain. Uh, and most companies cannot recover from those kind of uh, uh, incidents uh, that when they happen. Um, All right. Yeah, and, and to that point, you know, part of that is, um, you know, going back to the external and internal. You know, there's things that are well out of the, from an external perspective, are well out of the control of, of every organization that that drive um, the the requirements to managing these risks, and and those are, you know, as again uh, Tolga mentioned, you know, the regulatory compliance requirements, uh, as well as business commitments that that we might um, individually as organizations have to 
manage uh, you know those those uh, whether that's to third parties that we do business with or part of the supply chain, as well as even contractually things that that we're committed to from service levels that uh, that drive those the reasons for managing those. Um, also from a internal perspective, um, you know again you know these are all things that you know as we the business dynamics change or we have requirements to improve or verify that we can in fact uh, be a viable entity you know those are things that that drive um you know how we make decisions surrounding you know what amount of risk um, an organization wants to assume as well as the growth plans that might exist that can be including different geographies uh, that might have different requirements for managing risks as well as just even um, plans for the business overall from a growth perspective is uh, things change um, that uh, again has to be incorporated into the requirements for uh, managing those risks. So, you know, one one question that we we like to to throw out there is, you know, who who owns organizational risk and and uh, and that you know sometimes that sometimes can fall into, you know, security uh, if you have a security department or it's perceived to be a security um, component. Um, or it, uh, it, it maybe you have a risk or compliance uh, department, but ultimately this is a multi-dimensional uh, challenge for organizations, and it and it has to be viewed as a business issue. There's no just throwing the rock over the wall to one particular function within an organization, and that's something that is really critical to understand because as we talk through the balance of the of the uh, discussion today, you know, it's, it'll hopefully become more and more evident how there has to be collaboration between all the different functional areas of an organization um, to to achieve the, the goal of minimizing the risk uh, that the organization's assuming. So that's uh, just something to be aware of and keep in the back of your mind as we go through through the discussion today. Um, also from a, you know, this is something else that, uh, you know, we like to talk about. And if you've participate in any other uh, of our webinars, you know, we like to, to talk about this, this equation and, uh, and, and really talk about, you know, why these two factors are important as it relates to risk. So, you know, the, again, likelihood times impact is what drives your, your risk. And, and again, it's all a question going back to those different risks that organizations uh, have to deal with is, is what you're going to do to deal with the the likelihood and the impact of risk uh, to your organization. So you, in order to reduce risk, um, you have to either uh, reduce the likelihood or the impact or ideally both. But the, the goal is to get to a point where you're addressing those things. If you're not addressing those, then, then uh, you're, you're not dealing with the risk that your organization's um, you know, exposed to. And, and again, there's all types of ways that that can, as we talked about, uh, can impact the organization. And that's something that you have to recognize that, you know, the goal is ultimately to get to a point where you're minimizing the risk that the organization can have and the impact that it has on the, on the, as you as an entity. And there's a different number of different ways um, that you can do that. You know, one from a risk mitigation perspective, you know, one is to accept the risk. Um, the other is to avoid the other is to transfer and the other is to reduce. So accepting the risk um, is where you're deciding as an example that you're willing to fund the costs of that risk, the impact of that risk that it might have on your organization and that you are able to fund the recovery of that um, or, or recovery from that risk or an incident. And then, then you're willing just to accept that. And that might include things like deciding to defer investments in such things as upgrades to your technologies, or in sourcing some different type of uh, services uh, that you're funding and supporting from an organizational perspective. Um, the other is to avoid and reduce it. And that, that gets back to the whole, uh, the, the likelihood um, part of the equation on the prior, prior slide. So if you can avoid or reduce um, the risk, then that, that again minimizes you know, the potential impact on your organization as well as the, your overall risk um, uh, on a going forward basis. The next one, transfer, and, and then we'll talk about this in a few minutes, is where you're transferring that risk or the, the potentially the cost of that to an external entity. And one of the mechanisms for doing that is by using something like cyber insurance. And we'll, we'll, we'll revisit this slide in a little bit um, just to explain you know, why uh, potentially using the transfer option is not really a good 
good option. Uh, but again, want, don't want to take away the thunder of, uh, of uh, any of that until we get to that part of the conversation. So if there's any questions about this model or if anyone's not familiar with this, please, uh, please let us know as we go through the discussion. So having said all, all of that, um, you know, one, a couple of things that we'd like to just make sure um, you're thinking about as we go through this is, you know, are you familiar with the risk profile of your organization and maybe even the third parties that provide services to you? And, you know, what, what does that mean to your organization from a risk perspective? Uh, the second point there is, do you have a plan for proactively dealing with those, those uh, you know, existing or future risks? And, and that's something that is an ever ongoing thing. You know, again, very dynamic uh, world out there and, uh, and something that we have to absolutely keep on top of and, uh, and make sure we're managing. Um, the other is, uh, you know, from a compliance and regulatory perspective, you know, I, I, again, not, nothing against any of the security team members on, on the, the call today or the, the webinar, but, you know, you have to be um, working with your, your con, you know, compliance, your, your risk, uh, your uh, regulatory teams, legal, to understand, you know, what those requirements are from an organization perspective. Um, no one can be an expert in everything, and if you're not getting that type of input and working together, um, then ultimately you're putting your organization at risk. And then the last one there um, uh, is just understanding all the different assets uh, that your organization might rely on from a, a business perspective. And, uh, and that's something that it's amazing, especially with such things as shadow IT, um, how, how unaware organizations are of where their data resides or what uh, different uh, entities of the business might be using for supporting the business and especially uh, critical functions that the business relies on. So talk any if I may add something, Fred. Yep. Yeah, if yep. I may add anything, you know, on the third uh, column, actually, third party providers nowadays, actually, you need to understand, um, you know, the policy awareness and what their third parties are doing, what their policy awareness are, because it, it all depends on the data you have in your company and who whose data it is. And if you're working with third party, they, have, they are uh, subject to the same regulatory uh, uh, requirements that you have and sometimes, and you have to show proof that they are actually uh, have a policy awareness. They have training. Um, uh, they have monitoring in place that is complying with uh, what your organization uh, is doing with the data that you're working with. Um, so I, I think... Uh, third party providers are uh, also uh, can fit into that third column. Yep, per perfect example. And that's, that's where just having that awareness of what your organization relies on and making sure that those entities are, are doing everything they need to do to, to support your business based on your requirements. So great, great point. So we're going to talk um, just now for a few minutes about cyber insurance and again mentioned uh, that we're just going to do a quick overview of that. One one thing before we dig into that is um, ASMGI is not a, 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 an insurance provider, agent, broker. Um, so I just want to make that clear that we're not selling insurance products or anything like that. Uh, we're providing this overview as it relates to the requirements, as we mentioned up at the start of the discussion, uh, to make sure that it's clear what's required to be able to, to purchase insurance and cyber insurance and how that fits into an overall risk management program. So just uh, wanted to throw out that point just so everyone's aware of it. So from a cyber perspective, um, you know, again, uh, don't want to belabor this, but, you know, one of the things that that everyone, uh, you know, needs to be reminded of uh, periodically is the is the fact that cyber insurance is is designed to for a number of different things. And, and the one point there, which is underlined, is that it's intended to offset the costs involved with recovery from some type of cyber losses. And the key there is offset. Um, if you look at the, the, the statistics of what um, cyber uh, crime has, has uh, cost the world over the course of this past year um, and versus what's been paid out by the insurance providers, it's definitely, there's a, definitely a delta there. So the thing that point for making uh, or bringing this up is that I wanna make sure that it's clear that you're never going to uh, cover all the costs of an in cyber incident um, with cyber insurance. It'll help to offset those costs, 
but it's not going to actually cover those costs. And that's where it really comes down to, you know, how you manage the risk and the risk that your organization's subjected to as part of the, you know, the overall risk management program. Um, also, what's important is uh, that you understand the types of coverage that are available um, for from a cyber insurance provider. Um, and that's where, you know, again, you know, every, just like any type of uh, insurance policy, every policy is different. And unless you're providing or purchasing a policy that provides for a specific type of incident, there's a good chance that that, that might be an exclusion um, that, that you might not, uh, you know, have covered. So that's where, you know, again, you know, we, we have clients every day that we speak with when we are having these discussions. And it's amazing how many, um, you know, individuals within an organization are signing cyber insurance policies without um, IT or are, um, you know, even their security teams reviewing those before they're actually signed. So, you know, the, the, the individuals, and again, we'll talk about this, that understand the risk profile of the organization are not even involved in, in the execution of those, those uh, agreements. And that's something that um, not only from what's covered perspective, but also what's required to be in compliance to, to have a, an incident or, or a claim uh, paid for. Again, one of the main reasons for this discussion today. So again, if there's any questions about what these different types of coverages are, these are the probably the most common types when, uh, when you get into uh, really uh, going to look and shop for those. Um, from a, a applying perspective, this is where um, you know, a lot of the, the changes are occurring in the industry right now. Um, in the past, this was almost just like a, like a status there, you know, it was either a rider on existing insurance policy or, um, but then over time started a trend towards um, having a standalone policy. Also, you know, there, there was a very basic process for applying for insurance. And, and, and this is similar to, you know, third party assessments where, um, you know, it was basically a checkbox you know, someone fills out a form, there was no validation by the provider, and, and ultimately that put the providers at risk. And that's, uh, you know, the, the, one of the issues that's occurred now is with claims that, you know, the insurance providers were being asked to cover claims that, you know, potentially were not necessarily uh, valid because uh, there was misrepresentation of what the actual risk profile of an organization was. And that's something, again, you know, we're talking about billions, trillions of dollars here. And that's something that, uh, you know, we'll, we'll talk about in a minute uh, about how that's changing as we go forward. So today, instead of just that um, basic questionnaire, um, you know, typically there's a, a more detailed um, questionnaire that's being required, but still um, limited validation by the, the insurance provider. Uh, but that, again, is something that they, they recognize that there's still a requirement to understand what their risk profile is of the organization. And, uh, and then, as I state there, we're in the early stages of seeing, you know, some, some prerequisites for being eligible for insurance, as well as getting into this concept we'll talk about in a few minutes about continuous monitoring. So as organizations' risk profile changes, um, there's some way for the insurance provider to keep a pulse on that so they understand whether um, that entity is falling out of compliance with the requirements that they might have um, placed on, on them to be able to be insured. And then in the very near future, you know, seeing a lot of uh, change where, you know, besides a one-time, um, you know, questionnaire, uh, getting into a lot more detail and also, you know, the requirements to be able to demonstrate that those have actually um, those uh, those requirements have been met. Um, also, you know, there's some uh, continu you know, continuous monitoring, which you mentioned, um, is becoming more and more common. So that again, if someone falls out of compliance, that there's the ability to to uh, to flag that and uh, and deal with that as proactively as possible. And the last uh, bullet there is for providers actually providing services, so that if there were something was something that occurred. Um, there's an opportunity for them to help to limit the damages by having actual security resources involved in the actual uh, incident response. And that's something that, again, I think as time goes on, we're going to see more and more of that. Then um, when we get into, uh, you know, cyber insurance about what is covered, um, you know, again, this is going to vary depending on your requirements and, and the actual policy. 
but you know today uh, there's there's many times uh, the actual cost of probably for notification of entities if there was some type of incident. Um, also, if it involved uh, you know any type of data leakage, so P PCI, PHI, um, you know that or PII um, that could include some credit monitoring types of um, of services, as well as uh, for any civil damages that might uh, result from from uh, that incident. Uh, computer forensics, again, understanding the root cause of that, as well as any type of you know, reputational or brand damage and, and how to recover from that from a communications messaging perspective. Um, what's not covered uh, typically is the cost if you are sued because of some type of uh, potential pre-breach vulnerabilities, uh, that's typically not covered. Uh, reimbursement uh, for loss of future profits uh, Lost due to a cyber incident. Again, you know you're not going to get uh, reimbursed for for being down or, or the time that you're you're down due to that incident. Um, and then also losses due to theft or intellectual property or theft of intellectual property. That's something again that is uh, not covered. Also, if uh, this is where you know we get into a lot of debate or there's a lot of debate out there in the industry about whether the state sponsored. Um, you know, uh, incidents and, and who is behind that. Um, if there's anything that involves a nation state, that's not covered by uh, insurance, cyber insurance policy typically. Uh, and then the last point there is the cost to actually improve um, uh, the security or technology after an incident. Um, that's something that is, again, you know, not covered as part of a typical policy. Um, and then the other one, as far as covered in the future goes, I mentioned this previously, is the cost for those additional services. Those are becoming again more and more uh, available through entities, and something that that uh, you know everyone should be hearing more about as time goes on. Um, the next one, I apologize, this slide has a lot of information on it. Uh, in case anybody wanted to have this for reference, if you are looking to shop uh, for any or looking at the different options available, this is just the a listing of the insurance top insurance providers both in 2018 2019 as well as in 2020 uh, and you can see how they're ranked um, a couple of interesting points on this is the you know for the most part you know all the the premiums have increased from a year over year perspective uh, and and there's a lot of growth there um, so that's something that you know, again is telling uh, but again feel free we'll provide these slides uh, after and be available after the webinar uh, you can reference these to, to compare any of the different providers. So um, the next thing is, uh, this is this is from an entity called Cybersecurity Ventures. So going back to the, you know, the whole idea of what is covered and what's not covered, um, you know, just emphasize, and again, we hear about this every day, the magnitude of the costs that are, in, of the money that's in play here um, in uh, with, with the cyber crime. And again, we're not going to talk about every one of these statistics, but it is mind boggling to look at the money that's involved and why um, it's becoming so restrictive uh, for what is or is not covered by a cyber insurance policy or what the prerequisites are becoming more stringent because there's so much money at, at stake. Um, you know, again, every day you hear about a different incident, uh, well publicized uh, things that are affecting uh, various organizations around the world, and it just becomes more and more important to keep keep uh, you know that front of mind as you think about uh, you know how you're approaching your your risk profile and and because of those numbers um, you know basically costs of cyber insurance are increasing um, significantly over the course of the last several years and you know when you think about the numbers on the previous slide again you know it's amazing um, you know that uh, that the, the costs haven't risen more because of the the risk and the and the risk that the some extent the insurance providers have been provide assuming um, as a result of uh, of not having a, a good handle on what their clients are are uh, their risk profile are is so um, so because of that um, there there's an actual organization again if you tie it back to the slide that had the providers listed there um, this is a separately and uh, a separate entity that. Uh, that is, uh, well, I think we told you if you could check the question. Um, I'm checking the questions. There's a separate entity um, that 
these, uh, I guess it's six or seven uh, insurance companies or providers, cyber insurance providers are actually funding and established, you know, with the goal to get a better handle on how to manage the risks that they're assuming. Um, all of these entities obviously are in the business or, of being a profitable uh, in, in you know, organizations and they, they recognize the risk that they've been assuming over time and they've created this entity um, called Cyber Active View that they're looking at, you know, using their muscles to, to apply, you know, pressure on or to standardize the approach that's taken for um, cyber premium or provide, you know, policies, as well as the, the different, uh, you know, regulations and things that they could influence as, uh, as time goes on with the goal of getting a better handle on what's going on out there in the world and ultimately to provide, you know, a, a policy or a service that that's sustainable as well. So that's, uh, that's something again, you know, there, that, that as we go forward, you know, there's, there's plenty of opportunity for organizations to purchase cyber insurance, not trying to talk down on that, but the reality is uh, the cyber insurance companies recognize they can't sustain the losses that they have over time. And that it's important that they establish some type of, uh, more strict guidelines that the, all across the, the business, uh, you know, that they can uh, then enforce and, and on a going forward basis. So one uh, couple of things just real quickly. Um, so we, one of the, going back to the whole question of whether, um, you know, an organization understands your risk profile or not, there's something out there called security ratings, if anyone's not familiar with that. Um, and it's something that that uh, insurance providers are starting to use, and that goes back to the continuous monitoring. And it's uh, it's interesting that you know this is a, from a recent poll that we conducted that um, some organizations, or actually of 22 uh, responses that that uh, you you may have been 22 of those entities or 10 of those entities had. Uh, been asked or provided a security ratings report as part of qualifying for that uh, cyber insurance and that they they you know then had to deal with what that actually told them and then um, you know about half of those or more um, you know had never heard of that but that's again something that's becoming more and more prevalent out there and that also is something that's becoming more prevalent related to uh, third-party risk management as well so one one thing um, that uh, just wanted to throw out there, you know, there's uh, there's one of the services that that uh, if anyone's heard of that called Security Scorecard, and we had of the, all the uh, at least at the time of 50 other registrants for this organizations that register for this this uh, webinar. Uh, this is basically the the scores, and again, this is based on Security Scorecard categories. And we're not going to get into a deep dive on that, um, but but unfortunately, you could see that um, of the 50 organizations, about 13 of, or yeah, 14 of those um, have an overall grade of C, D, or F, which is, is not you know, a very good uh, risk posture or profile. Um, the other thing to note is uh, from a follower's perspective, you know, this is something else that all of these, just like credit rating agencies that from a consumer perspective, there's 1,100 uh, or 1,173 organizations that are following the 50 organizations that make up this this you know this this group of uh, registrants for this webinar. So if you thought that this was something that wasn't being heavily used out there, um, you know it's uh, it's definitely something that is important to be aware of. These could be um, individuals that are you're doing business with your customers. That are tracking, you know, what your risk profile is. It could be things like insurance providers, uh, other third-party entities that you're doing business with, and then, um, you know, so it's, again, it's something that's becoming more and more common out there. And then the last, uh, we'll just talk about this: the the actual distribution across these various categories that are basically the vulnerabilities and risk profiles uh, of the, across application security. Uh, through social engineering, you could see what the distribution is across the 50 organizations that are represented here, um, where where the different uh, scores are for each of those different categories. And we'll we'll uh, we'll talk about an offer that we have related to this. If you'd like to understand where your organization falls relative to this, but the big question here is, 
you know, if you were applying for cyber insurance and the cyber insurance provider ran a, a security scorecard or other security rating report on your organization, you know, the question is, are you actually insurable or not? And that's something that, that uh, you know, again, you know, there, there's really unfortunately nowhere to hide today in, in uh, with all the information that's out there. So Togo, I'll stop for a second. Was there, was there a question that? Uh... Yeah, there was actually a very, very good question. Um, uh, what do you recommend as an approach to understanding the cyber risk profile of your organization? Um, I think we talked about, you mentioned the business, it's a business issue, right? Um, so instead of saying, hey, let's look at your websites, your network segmentation, your, uh, if you have um, your end user protection and every tool that we can talk about, I think it starts from understanding your organization and what type of data you store in your organization, whose data it is, uh, what would be the consequences if something happens to that data is where we start. Uh, legislative and, uh, uh, and uh, um, uh, uh, consequences you have. Then we, once we understand the business risk profile, now we can look at your technology, right? Now we can look at your websites and network and, and users and, and the technologies in place uh, to come up with the best cyber risk profile for your organization on the right level. One other thing I was going to mention is, you know, uh, a lot of the questions we, we get sometimes, hey, what level of cybersecurity insurance I should buy? Uh, okay, a fair, fair question. Uh, to answer that, we cannot answer that question without understanding the business impact. If you get hacked, what happens and what your exposure would be, and that's really to what type of data you have and uh, if that data is being exposed. Um, that's the right answer. The other part that I wanted to mention before we move on from the cyber uh, insurance is there's a reality of, we get this all the time, uh, cyber insurance claim denial. And there is uh, the things that you mentioned before, uh, Frank, um, more and more the insurance claims are uh, catching people for maintain the failure, you know, keeping up. Uh, and we're gonna talk about some of that. How can we do that? Be, be, be part of the proactive part of it. Um, like if you have PCI fines, right? Assessments, this, this is, these are real. I see people uh, claims de getting denial. Uh, it could be cyber extortion. And, and some other times, let's say that I'm gonna give a simple example. Um, you're only covered for certain uh, cyber issue for 20 grand and the ransomware ransom uh, where is asking for 30 you're only covered for 20 so uh that's how much they're going to pay besides the things that they they might not uh, uh they might deny you ultimately because you have not maintained your environment um but also they might only pay a certain part of the uh um exposure you have or money that financial loss that you you might have because you didn't really assess what type of cyber insurance you need, um, or you didn't do your job uh, for maintaining, being PCI compliant and so on and so forth, or you didn't pay attention. Uh, um, and one, uh, the worst example I have seen is, you know, sometimes the bad guys are in your system for a long time and you buy cyber insurance at some point, but you never realize that there was an exposure happened prior months that they were in your system and you got denial fully and that cyber insurance money you paid did no good to you. Um, so these are also the real life examples that I can just bring it up, but that was a great question. Um, and Irma, there's more to it uh, that I would love to take another tabletop or uh, you know, out of this conversation. Uh, we can talk even further down on the technology aspects of some of the things that you can do uh, to really understand your cyber risk profile. Right. Yeah. And that, that really does uh, lead right into the next part of the conversation. So, so you know, the, again, another formula here, but, you know, basically, you know, we, we really look at it from a, a two aspect component. Risk management is, you know, understanding your risk, as you were just mentioning, you know, what, and that, again, is a variety of things as it relates to your organization, and then having some ability to deal with those things, which is the incident response program. So going back to this, um, this graphic again. We said we were going to revisit this. The, you know, the points that we want to make here is that you know, if, very likely the cost, uh, if you accept. So the reason why we have accept crossed out is that the cost for accepting the risk um, and uh, that you're taking on as an organization, you know, could potentially put you out of business. So we we don't really think that that's 
a viable alternative that that uh, you know because of the impact and the reliance on technology today that it's reasonable to accept the risk that uh, might occur from some type of cyber incident. So we, we believe that that's not a very good alternative. Um, transfer the risk. Uh, we emphasize how the uh, cyber insurance offsets the cost for um, uh, an actual uh, cyber incident, but does not fully uh, pay that. And as, as we mentioned, the escalating costs of cyber incidents um, you know, really almost makes it, you know, impossible as well to rely on cyber insurance or with all the exclusions that exist of not what's not covered. You know, really the only alternatives are to avoid and reduce the potential for some type of cyber risk. And that's that's what we'll talk about as we go through the balance of the conversation here. So that's where, um, you know, again, you know, you know, not to say that cyber insurance is not important because it does play a factor but it's not what your organization should rely on. It's going to be the silver bullet. So from a risk assessment perspective, um, you know, again, going into, um, you know, all the different components of that, you know, really understanding what your organization's risk profile is, making sure that, you know, there's a, and again, this gets into a lot of detail as, uh, as Tolga mentioned, uh, but just really understanding those, um, having that different perspective. So, you know, there's uh, what we call the outside in uh, view, which is what the security scorecard, the, that rating table shows. Um, you know, we call that the hacker's eye view. You know, any anyone anywhere can assess the risk of your organization, whether, whether you like it or not, um, based on, you know, doing, you know, using tools that are readily available out there. And that, uh, that ultimately can uh, tell whether they're, you're a good target for some type of exploit or, or uh, attack. And that, that unfortunately, there's nowhere to hide from that in today's day and age. Um, also, you know, we know that there's uh, threats that exist within an organization, and that could be a combination of just vulnerabilities uh, within your four walls, or potentially um, because of inside threats. And that's something that you have to understand. Um, in order to really get a handle on that, um, you have to have a good sense of what your your technology assets are and what the um, what the, the the breadth and the, the the your attack surface looks like, um, then using some type of monitoring detection, um, so they have full full time visibility on what those actual um, you know assets are doing and that whether there's any type of uh, things that that could kick or trigger any type of uh, detection of something that's anomalous, and then ultimately um, not just having that visibility but actively managing. The vulnerabilities that exist and doing remediation of those it doesn't do any good just to know that you have risks or or vulnerabilities you have to actually um, deal with those and then um, you know as you get into doing that on a going forward basis there's the whole process of planning you know for end of life and and anticipating that as part of your business cycle whether that's a capital operating budget um, activity um, then when you get into that, um, you know, there's the application component. So we talked, that was just the technology piece of it and the business piece. Um, also from an application perspective, you know, there's many different flavors of applications out there. And that's where you really have to understand what your organization uses and what the, the potential risk profile of those are as well. And then the same type of thing, you know, again, very consistent here. Um, you have to manage the vulnerabilities that might exist within those applications, whether they're internally developed, uh, provided by uh, a, a, a SaaS provider, or even something that you had custom developed for your organization. And then from an end user perspective, again, you know, here every day of the phishing attacks and and uh, and someone clicking on a link or, or some type of, uh, you know, account credentials uh, takeover or compromise, um, that's where it's really important to have that third aspect of dealing with the end users and further education and just being aware of, uh, of what those things uh, that could impact your organization. So I know, um, you know, part of this too is, again, we're not gonna get into all the details here is, this is really kind of a, a, a detailed process over the next few slides to get into, again, uh, pulling back the covers under all those different potential attack uh, vectors and drilling into what they actually you know, what that threat is to your organization. And, and the reason why that's important is because it it does tie back to then, you know, and we'll talk about this in a few minutes about what your actual incident response process is and how that that plays into, you know, knowing what the risk and attack vectors are, 
for your organization, getting into then having some type of plan for dealing with those. And then there's a different different ways that you can address um, all the things that we talked about. And again, that that you know we we talk about those in terms of both third parties as well as the technology applications and end users within your environment. And this is again kind of a cookbook almost if you look at it like that of what we would recommend as far as having the different, you know, the program and your processes, and in some cases actually technology. So three-legged stool, as we like to say, um, and uh, how important it is to have all those available. So again, you know, we're not going to talk through each one of these, but, you know, a consistent theme of having the inventory, um, understanding what the risk profile is of all the different things that are listed in the columns, um, having some type of monitoring. Again, it doesn't do any good you know, we hear all the time about um, entities using, you know, not the name of product, but, you know, some type of uh, SIM or something that collects your logs, unless you're alerting on those and have real time visibility to what's going on with those, they unfortunately don't do, do you any good. And that's where, you know, doing that real time uh, as, uh, as things occur is, is so important. Um, and then also, you know, once you are monitoring that, then you have the ability to to know what the vulnerabilities are that exist um, based on the changes in your environment and then actively remediating those is what's really even more critically important. So having that visibility, dealing with how to prioritize those things, um, the active monitoring, and then ultimately the management and remediation of those vulnerabilities has to be part of that overall program. Um, I may, if I may add one yeah. thing here, um, the hardest part of this and someone that was doing it day to day for our company and other companies that we provide services for, uh, the, the biggest risk I, uh, I see here is the, what I call internal IT uh, fatigue. Um, this is a program. Uh, there's, you know, it's, you're never going to reach 100% um, uh, coverage. Uh, and it's, it's an everyday uh, repartization. Uh, and there's a lot of challenges goes with that when you say prioritization. It could be a server upgrade. It could be a, a cipher upgrade. Uh, it could be anything that you, you have to understand what business needs are and reprioritize it based on uh, what you're every single day that you're dealing with. Um, and uh, you got to have a good team in front of you that is dedicated to make sure that that operational part of things uh, is being taken care of. You can do, uh, you know, patching, um, vulnerability management, remediation, and so on and so forth. Um, it, it's it's not uh, cannot be just given the security team and say, hey, you know, get to it when you can. Um, it is a challenge for operations to making sure the rest of the company knows that what uh, that prioritization is and taking immediate action when needed. Great, great points. Thank you. So as we mentioned, this is just the one component. This is really that if you want to call it a risk assessment, risk, the visibility to what, what is going on. And then the other piece, again, you know, unfortunately, you know, has to be dealt with as well as really incident response. So, um, you know, we're not going to read every bullet point here, but the, the point on this is that, you know, you have, you know, there is very likely the chance that some type of incident is going to occur for better, for worse, and you have to be prepared to deal with that. You don't want to be trying to determine how to deal with some type of cyber incident, you know, at the time that it's actually occurring, because you'll, you'll one, you'll cost yourself, you know, extended downtime. Uh, you won't be responsive versus reactive. Um, and then you, you want to ultimately be in a position to minimize the impact that that has on the organization. So when we mentioned earlier um, that this is a business issue, um, you can see the multiple inputs that are required. And, and we'd, we'd love the opportunity if you're interested uh, to have further discussions on this, if there's things that you're, you're not uh, sure about how they play into this. But the bottom line is it has to be a, a cross-functional um, you know, component to what you're doing as an organization because there's all these different factors that, that are inputs into how you respond as part of your incident uh, response, not react. And, and if you addressed all these things, and again, it's a pretty daunting list, um, but ultimately um, those are the things that do need to be taken into account to, to make sure that uh, you can properly respond to an incident. And then, you know, one of the things that we recommend, and, and this is a, a model and graphic based on the NIST 800-61 uh, framework. Um, again, there's other frameworks out there, but 
you know, is to really adopt some type of, of, of model that you're, you're rallying around uh, because that's, again, something that, you know, you can talk a common language with service uh, providers that you might use. Um, it's something that there's all types of resources out there in the world um, that you can leverage. But we really um, try to break things down or the, the whole model breaks things down into the various bullet points that are under those four different large arrows. And, and, it, and it all comes back to, you know, again, breaking down the problem. And as it's, uh, as we indicate across the top here, there's the things that occurred pre-incident, during the incident, post-incident. And that's again, same thing, you know, you have to be aware of what those requirements are as you get into um, dealing with any type of incident. And as much as you can in the preparation stages, we like to say on that one slide the, that we had sort of that cookbook, um, if you're doing all those things upstream in that green arrow, um, and, uh, and understand, you know, what you have to do to prevent some type of incident, then, you know, hopefully you're reducing the likelihood and the impact um, that uh, is, is, that your organization might uh, experience as a result of some type of incident. Then, you know, if something does occur, that's when you get into having to deal with all the, the execution of your incident response plan. And then another uh, more detailed version of this is, you know, how we break down, um, you know, implementing an incident response program. And we call it a program because it's not just something that is a flip of the light switch um, that you have to go through and do. And, and again, you know, the, the, the first arrow there is a stop gap. We recommend if you don't have an incident response program in place to get something that can provide you some, some you know, air cover while you're putting that, that going through the organizational change management and engaging different parts of your organization and getting to the point where, where you're actually prepared to uh, deal with something. And, and that's why we refer to it as a stop gap. So do, doing those things again, very quickly, um, you know, just to get to a point, I again, understand that that could be complicated in large organizations, but uh, again, you have to have something in place to be as proactive as possible. And then you go through the program development, implementation, and then a continual evol evolution of that as you go forward. So I know we're um, getting down to running up to the time here. Um, was there any questions that uh, we have come in or, or uh, told any comments on this? this yeah, collect, there, there has been a couple of questions. Um, before I get into the questions, there was really good questions. Uh, uh, one thing I want to highlight here, I know it's hard to digest that there's a lot of information here, but um, incident response plan, uh, incident response policy, in, you know, your playbook, these are very, very important subjects. And most uh, internal IT, uh, their job is that when the incident does happen, you know, they will try to contain and eradicate it right away. Uh, well, uh, if you really did not think through these uh, four steps that, you know, understand the risk, understand the containment strategy, uh, ev evidence gathering, uh, give you guys a live example. Um, an internal resource caused a, a cyber uh, security incident um, and uh, internal IT, you know, immediately stopped and eradicated the issue. Well, in the process, they lost the forensic analysis, they didn't do forensic analysis and lost the evidence. So they couldn't take the company, even though the layer losses were uh, so great, they couldn't take any legal action. Uh, they couldn't take advantage of, even touch the cybersecurity insurance because they didn't follow the, uh, their uh, containment strategy and understand the type of uh, issue they were having. And they could have uh, followed certain steps and get the forensic analysis team um, per se um, in, in place in the right time uh, before the, all the data was uh, wiped out um, so that they could take legal action and possibly avoid uh, huge financial losses. So it is, it is really important, regardless of the size of your company, uh, to have that uh, strategy, uh, understanding like uh, how the process needs to work and making decisions. Uh, um, and that policy is being uh, you know, implemented and resources being trained to do and follow certain uh, steps in that process. Uh, besides that, we had a couple good questions. Um, I did the best I can to answer. One of the questions, uh, let me come here, um, was, uh, 
are you guys seeing insurance carriers stating that uh, bid side ratings are something they look at? Um, yes, but there's about uh, nine, 10 other that I, uh, organizations that I know that they could uh, take, but they're, they absolutely, that's not the only factor they look at. Uh, that's uh, usually addresses external uh, vulnerabilities that they will look at uh, how, and I think Frank showed that. And uh, Frank, if you want to pull that uh, earlier, um, that, 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 so there's multiple services out there. And again, um, this is the one that we, um, you know, leverage, uh, ourselves is security scorecard, but there's multiple services. And one of the use cases for the use of these services is by cyber insurance providers where they continuously monitor the entities that they're providing, um, services to. So it's not shown on here, but one of the items that's in in the report across all these different categories is the actual change on a on a 30-day uh, window for the various categories which can be a symptom of something that's occurring within within an organization um, so that's something that that is leveraged so that you can be alerted real time or those entities could be re alerted real time if something's occurring that there's potentially something that's going on within an organization. So that's why we think this is so powerful. And these types of services are evolving as well over time where there's also internal monitoring that's going on that could show that there's something that uh, is occurring as well. So this is not a replacement for um, like a, a monitoring and detection and response type of capability, but it certainly provides a, a, a piece of information that that, uh, that you have to deal with as an organization because it could have uh, an impact on you know, your, your um, ability to do business with an entity as well as even whether you're insurable or not. So, I mean, uh, insurable or not, but you have across the uh, board, uh, you have F, for instance, based on this criteria, your, ins your insurance is gonna be high. So is it worth to spend some time to, uh, let's call it a get well plan, right? Uh, you go in and uh, start addressing your vulnerabilities, start addressing your exposure and attack surface by making sure your website is, uh, is uh, secure, your uh, network is segmented, you implement MFA, you uh, put a policy in place for a uh, password policy in place. I can go on and on and on and things that you can do. You know, your, your servers are upgraded and supported. Uh, I can go on and on and on for <laughs> 10, 15 minutes uh, now, now your uh, insurance, uh, cybersecurity insurance is going to be uh, cost you much less, and the likelihood of uh, likelihood of uh, you have is uh, your attack surface is gonna shrink, and likelihood of you getting hacked is gonna minimized. Um, so all that, uh, all that, you know, is a good um, indicator that what you should do. Uh, to the earlier question, you know, how do you uh, address your uh, risk profile? Um, I think uh, for the first couple of slides that we mentioned, you start there, you know, address your risk profile from a business perspective, then move into your uh, technology uh, 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 portfolio and third party risk, address those, and then come up with a plan. Uh, let's call it a get well plan to address those things be before even looking for cybersecurity insurance. Because if you go in there first, you claim, you know, you it's going to cost you a lot. Second, you're more than uh, subject to a uh, claim denial if something does happen, or your uh, financial loss is not going to be covered. Let's don't talk about the brand loss and everything else. A lot of companies that I have seen that uh, went through that when they had a cyber, ins uh, ins uh, even those have cybersecurity insurance, when they have an incident. Uh, on the long run, they might recover for the first couple of months, but on the long run, their brand got so damaged that they, on the long run, they don't uh, really recover from uh, the loss uh, of the brand uh, uh, profile. All, all great points. And, and we'd, we'd love the opportunity to continue this conversation if anyone's interested. I know we're, we're right at the top of the hour. Um, just to kind of wrap up, um, you know, hopefully we, We've covered the objectives and key takeaways from the conversation. Um, you know, again, can't stress enough how important it is to not rely on cyber insurance. That's a component of your risk management program. 
uh, but hopefully all the things that we highlighted that can help you um, reduce or avoid um, any type of cyber incidents, uh, you know, were, were, were answered. And again, all these slides are available as well as the recording of the webinar. We'll get that posted and distributed as well. Um, as we mentioned, um, you know, just for a special offer for everyone that's attended today, um, you know, we, we summarized the information uh, across the registrants for the webinar, but if you'd like to actually see your um, cyber ratings report, um, for if you're interested in that, please just uh, send an email to myself and, uh, and, and we'll, we'll go ahead and run that report for you and schedule a session to review that so you can understand where you fall across all those different 10 categories and what your overall grade is if, if that's something that you're not familiar with. And then last but not least, uh, we do have another webinar coming up on uh, re related to the Executive Order 14028. Um, that's on December 2nd. Uh, that's something else that uh, is, is extremely critical. And uh, if you're not familiar with that executive order, uh, we, we definitely recommend that you uh, consider listening to this uh, or attending this webinar. So thank you again for, for excuse me, everyone's uh, uh, detention today. Included also with this um, slide deck is we have a, a couple of slides of reference information um, that uh, you know, if you are interested in other details about some of the things we talked about today, then uh, that's available in the slides as well. So I know we're past our time. Tolga, great discussion as always with you. Appreciate uh, all the, uh, the points that you made and, and thank you everyone again for your time. We appreciate- Frank, uh, one your... last thing. Can we pass the registration link for the next uh, webinar? That someone yeah, asked- every, Everyone, ask everyone that attended today will uh, will go ahead and include the, the webinar link as well as the link to this content. Uh, so you have that available as well. So anything else? No, nope. thank you very much for your time and patience and uh, talk to you guys, uh, talk to you guys uh, in the future. Yep, thanks for taking some time out of your day. Have a great day, thank you. Well done. Uh...